little change of scenery today. Thought it'd be nice to hang out with uh, Yoda as we talk about risk management. Because whether you know it or not, you are in the risk management business. Life overall is pretty much a risk management business in some way, shape, or form. But your financial choices are definitely no different. And the way you save, invest, trade, or speculate totally reveals your current risk management. So today, we'll just be exploring that. And if you're new here, thank you for joining me. My name is Matt, and this is my channel. It's called Trade In Your Job. The trade in your job has a dual meaning. It's on the one hand about trading, stocks, options, ETFs, those sorts of things, but also trading, investing, personal finance as a means to an end of someday no longer trading your time for money in the form of a job you have to go to. So the ability to trade in your job for more freedom. I think most of us would enjoy the peace and security that comes with that kind of independence. So. If you've been feeling anxious or dreading your planning, you're in the right place. And we talk about a variety of topics on this channel. I promise my production quality will improve. I've got some new equipment on the way. Thanks for sticking around if you've been here a while already. As far as my background, you know, my love for personal finance goes back to when I was little and I received my $5 a week allowance and I used to hoard it and thought about how big it could grow. And then eventually I started investing in mutual funds, UTMA account uh, that my father set up and I would mail off money orders that I would go buy with my cash and send in to purchase shares. And I kept track of all that on a folded up sheet of notebook paper. So really good uh, bookkeeping system back then. Uh, this was long before digital, digital purchases. So that was the only option. Also, then in high school, I took millionaire economics, which was an elective, and I just learned about the basics and what money could do for you. Um, then in college, I did further my education in regards to personal finance. I didn't have a finance related major, uh, which is definitely a thing I regret. Um, I just really didn't know what I wanted to do uh, in college and took something that I thought interested me at the time, and then eventually it didn't. So uh, after graduating, um, I went to graduate school and then I worked for the federal government for five years. And I just found that I really enjoyed helping my coworkers with their money. I explained how the thrift savings plan retirement plan worked, what the five funds were that were inside of it at the time, the life cycle funds, how they operated, you know, that savings rate was the most important thing they could control, helping them figure out that, you know, a big truck payment wasn't really going to get them where they wanted to be based on what they were telling me they wanted to do. Uh, so I turned that love into uh, obtaining my Series 7, 63 and 65, which were, you know, registered rep licenses, worked in mutual fund and brokerage for five years. And so the reality of talking to people about their investments when there's a sales aspect is a lot different than educating them. And so now I know myself a little bit more and I enjoy more just educating. So I thought YouTube was a really great avenue to do that. Now 38, I have a lot more knowledge and experience under my belt. I've also uh, entered the mortgage industry as of a few years ago. So now I have that perspective. It was um, different being on this side. You know, I'd already purchased two houses and refinanced, or three houses and refinanced twice. So, uh, you know, being on both sides of it, I understand a lot more of that now. And I also recently obtained a certification as a personal finance counselor because so much of what we do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis with our money just goes back to even what we saw our parents do or what we saw friends do. So it was helpful to have that perspective too. So put all that together for all those knowledges and strategies that I've gleaned, just a simple plan that you implement and execute consistently is by far the most likely way to achieve success. So. Today, I'd just like to put saving, investing, trading, speculating in perspective, especially as they relate to risk management in your short-term and your long-term financial life. As far as a, any disclaimer for today, you know, this is all high-level stuff, just in general, good money management practices and what research and history shows over time to be the greatest chance of financial independence. So. None of this is really my opinion. It's all verifiable. And, you know, none of this is something that you should immediately go implement on your own or anything like that. Um, if you have someone that you can talk to about your benefits and your 
financial plan, that would probably be the best place to start. So this is pretty much informational and a starting place for you to amend your plan if necessary or be happy with what you have going if you're doing most of these things. So what are saving, investing, trading, and speculating? Sometimes saving and investing are confused or used interchangeably. So saving in the context of this video is going to mean money that you receive that's post-tax and goes into a savings account, liquid assets not used to invest. Savings accounts for the last 10 years or so in the time of the zero interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve, they've been around zero. And I know that now you've got some three and 4% um, so those, though, when you compare to inflation, are still losing money. So the risk with just saving your money is just that, that you will likely never save your way to financial independence because it's a simple fact that currency loses value over time. You must beat that erosion or inflation, inflation to even maintain your purchasing power over long periods of time. So the reason investing is different than saving is because when you invest, you're increasing your purchasing power over the time, or you're having an expectation at least of increasing your purchasing power over time. So with a savings account, that doesn't happen. So another note about saving versus investing. Saving in a bank account is FDIC insured, both checking, savings, certificate of deposits, those sorts of things. They are insured by the FDIC, typically up to $250,000. Uh, brokerage accounts, are not insured that way. They're insured by a different agency or entity called SIPC, S-I-P-C, and uh, it doesn't work the same way. So FDIC insurance is like a guarantee. SIPC insurance is insuring against the, uh, the broker going out of business, not against your securities going to zero. So the, the, that is an important distinction whenever you're talking about savings and investing is that you know savings don't necessarily have the risk of loss in terms of your dollars disappearing, um, they do have the inflation risk, obviously. Um, but in a brokerage account, if you held cash, it wouldn't necessarily be FDIC insured. Sometimes there are FDIC insured cash or sweep accounts inside the brokerage accounts, but like some money markets, they're not going to be FDIC insured. So uh, just an important distinction between those two different types of accounts. So if we know that straight up saving the money will likely not get us where we need to be, then investing is taking a calculated risk because you know savings will not get you to financial independence. So therefore investing becomes necessary. The data regarding investing is pretty clear. The things that you can control are your savings rate, meaning how much of your income that you receive you don't spend. So if you make $100 and you spend 75 of it, then $25 is your 25% your in that example is your savings rate. Another thing you control is your asset selection, meaning what things you choose to invest in. The asset location, meaning is it in a taxable account? Is it in a 401k? Is it in an IRA? Is it in a crypto wallet? And then the asset allocation, meaning how much of your assets, whether it's existing money or new money, you're gonna devote to that asset class. And then finally, the expense involved with the type of account, the thing that you're buying. So all of those things are things that are published and you can look up and measure and control. Over long periods of time, very few actively managed funds or ETFs outperform index funds that they track or measure success against. So if you're going to do anything outside of investing in low cost index funds, you're increasing the risk level and expenses of your portfolio. There is a whole industry designed to make complex products for people that do not necessarily understand them. And baffle them with bullshit is the phrase that comes to mind for this one. At any rate, with the money you're investing for your financial security and future independence, it's likely that your best bet is picking low cost index fund and just shoveling lots of money into them. Because once you hit a 25% savings rate of your gross income, you can pretty much trade and speculate anything beyond that without any fear of going uh, going broke because you can be confident that that other money, the 25% is on autopilot and historically is going to result in a good outcome. And even if you lost all the money you were trading or speculating with, you had your basis covered. As far as trading is concerned, as long as you're doing the investing portion correctly, in terms of managing your risk in asset allocation and all those things, you can 
have the freedom to trade any opportunities that you see, whether that's mispricing, whether that's your uh, asset that you're watching, your asset class is a few standard deviations away from the average price. Um, you know, you want to come up with some rules about when you would enter or exit a trade, use stop losses, you know, have a written plan so that when you, you know, reach those, those <laughs> decision points, you can actually make the decision. So uh, as far as trading, you know, that is something I explore on my channel and I do enjoy, but for the most part, most of our old money and new money is in low cost index funds. And so the portion I'm trading with is more just for, you know, uh, calculated gambling, I guess it's, you know, a way to say it. And then, you know, I'll talk about speculating next and that's even a, a lesser portion of your money and what you should be uh, should be doing with just a small portion of your money. So speculating, I would say, is more like a YOLO, like it could go your way, could not go your way. You're not really basing it on anything observable. You're, you know, buying zero days to expiration options. You don't understand them. You're uh, you're buying out of the money options that are like home run hits uh, that may never be in the money. It's just, you know, it's not a calculated risk at that point. It's, you know, kind of like playing the lottery, I guess. Speculating would be like playing the lottery. So, you know, the math is against you, but you say you got to play to win, right? And yes, people do occasionally win. But if you're speculating with a very big portion of your money or not doing the other things correctly, then this can really hurt your long-term prospects. So if you're doing any speculating or finding yourself thinking about doing speculating with any of your already saved or invested money, just make sure you're doing it with a portion that won't materially impact your life if it were to all go away, because that is totally a possibility. So is there a simple way to think about saving, budgeting, investing, trading, and speculating, and how to do it within defined parameters? Well, luckily, the Money Guy Show has created this resource. And if you just search, you know, Google for Money Guy Financial Order of Operations, it's public domain. So here it is. Uh, they're not in any way endorsing what I'm saying or sponsored. You know, I'm not sponsored by them yet. Just kidding. So anyway, just when you think about savings, you know, for the first step there is savings. Do you have enough savings for your highest deductible to be covered? Typically, that'd probably be your health insurance, right? Uh, or your homeowner's insurance. So is your are, is your highest deductible covered? And then you move on to two, you're already into investing in step two because that is your employer match. Typically, you're not gonna be able to do trading or speculating in that account. There's very few employer plans that have a broker's window where you can get into trouble. You're not gonna be able to trade options. You know, so it's it's really kind of preventing you from doing anything that's too risky. Um, I guess leaving the money in a cash position for all the years, a money market, that could be risky since we looked at the fact that savings, you know, will, will erode over time because currency just loses value to inflation over time. So then in step three, you're on a high interest debt. You could think of this as savings on interest. You're saving money from giving it to the creditor because you're paying less interest because you're attacking your high interest debt. And then you move into step four, and then you're putting savings in your pocket. In step five, you're investing still in your tax-free buckets, your Roth and your health savings account, and you're trying to build up your you know, tax diversification. And then in step six, that would be max out retirement. So you're still in the saving and investing phase all the way through step six. Then when you get into step seven, hyperaccumulation, that's really where trading and speculating could kind of live. Um, you know, I would say that Brian and Bo, the money guy show guys, they would probably not say that, but once you're doing all of those first step, six steps correctly, um, especially if you don't necessarily have like a family that's relying on that additional money, there's, you know, it's really dependent on your situation, how much risk you can afford to take, but that's where you could, you know, do some YOLO things and not be worried about the the outcome if you never see that money again because you're doing all those other things right so that's the nice thing about you know managing your cash flow uh in this manner is that you don't have to really worry anymore because you're doing so much right 
that even if you you messed up on some other piece outside of it, your whole plan is not going to fall apart. So I hope that seeing that makes some sense and puts it in perspective of what does good savings, investing, trading, and speculating look like in terms of your financial plan. I hope all of that made sense and I gave it enough context. If you have any follow-up questions, comments, concerns, please leave them down below, or you can email me, tradeinyourjob at gmail.com. If you have any specific scenario questions, happy to address those. Any mortgage-related questions, we're seeing an uptick in uh, in people under contract. So if you'd like to, uh, to explore any of those questions, please let me know. I'll be putting out a new video this weekend, likely. So thanks for joining me, and I'll see you then.